Greetings, Cornerstone family. It's good to be with you this evening. Uh, glad to be back to our normal Wednesday schedule, uh, putting out some videos for your edification, I hope and uh, pray. Uh, tonight, we're going to finish up our study through the life of Elijah. Now, we've already moved from Elijah to Elisha, but I didn't want to leave off this study with Jezebel still alive. And so we've got to move forward a little bit in the story to get to uh, to see how it, it finally plays out in terms of Jezebel and the descendants of Ahab. But uh, we'll get to that in a moment. I just wanted to uh, to remind you to be praying for one another. Um, we do have some COVID cases in the church right now. Um, and uh, Emma Uswick is one of those that I shared with you Sunday. Uh, she is our only nursing home resident, and she tested positive. I believe it was Saturday. Um, she sounds pretty rough, um, um, but as far as I know, she's hanging in there and doing okay. Um, so continue to pray for Emma. Pray for one another. Uh, please let us know if there are needs that you're aware of um, and things that we can do to help you. Um, there are others with it in our church as well. So far, um, everyone seems to be doing okay. Uh, but continue to pray. There's a lot of new cases. And um, I, I just want to say our, our leadership met last night. And, you know, one of the things we continue to say is we're going to be evaluating on a weekly basis. What do we do about Sundays? What do we do about other programs? And right now, uh, so many of us, uh, so many of you are, are out of an abundance of caution, just staying home. We're going to stay with our normal schedule um, uh, for, for the foreseeable future. Just continue to do our two services. That means we'll probably be a lower number in each service, and um, and I know sometimes that can be a little um, discouraging maybe if you're used to seeing more people there and you look around there aren't as many people. Um, don't let that discourage you or dissuade you. Uh, there are uh, There is no difference in the power of God or the presence of the Spirit of God, whether there's 30 of us in one service or 100 of us in one service. So uh, just continue to come and be obedient and worship, and um, and, and God will honor that and bless that. Um, so tonight, what I want to do is uh, take a look at 2 Kings. Now, we have to jump forward in our story, 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10. Now, if I were to read this, I would already be using a ton of time. So what I'm going to ask you to do is if you want to pause the video, go read those two chapters. You really uh, need to read both of them, although... Um, we won't be looking at all of chapter 10, um, but uh, we'll be looking at the first portion of it. So pause the video, read chapters 9 and 10 of 2 Kings, and that way as I refer to it, you already have it in mind, and uh, I'll point you to some verses as we, um, as we work our way through this. Now, if you'll remember, uh, we're given a roadmap of God's plan for the house of Ahab, uh, really as well as the northern kingdom, in the ministry of Elijah. Back in 1 Kings 19, God tells Elijah, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you've arrived, you anoint Hazael king over Aram, and Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahalah, you will anoint as prophet in your place. Now, um, then God says, it shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha, shall put to death. Um, so what we're essentially told here is that these three people that Elijah was going to anoint, the king of Aram, which is just to the north of Israel, and uh, they were sort of constantly battling one another. Aram and, and uh, the northern kingdom of Israel were always uh, having these border skirmishes. And um, in fact, that is how Ahab dies. Ahab, Ahab dies in a war with Aram, with Hazael as king, uh, just a couple of chapters after this is written. So you've got these three men uh, who are listed here, and the way they're described is they are described as instruments of God's judgment on the house of Ahab and on the northern kingdom of, of Israel. So by the time we get to our place here in 2 uh, Kings chapter 9, Ahab is already dead and has been dead. His son, uh, Ahaz Ahaziah, uh, was also killed in 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, the king of Judah that we're dealing with here in chapter 9 is also named Ahaziah. So don't get those two confused. You had a son of Ahab, Ahaziah, who's dead. Now you've got a king of Judah named Ahaziah who's here with um, uh, the, the, the king of the northern kingdom at this time. And, uh, and so they're going to uh, be a little bit confusing if you're not careful with those names. Uh, but all that we have left now 
uh, is Jezebel and the other unnamed uh, descendants of Ahab. Um, and so what we see is that God's raising up Jehu to be his instrument of judgment on what is left of Ahab's line. So what do we know about Jehu here? Um, and uh, he's coming up against Joram, who is now the king of the northern kingdom, another son, a descendant of Ahab. Of, excuse me, Ahab. Um, but what do we know about this guy, Jehu? Um, well, uh, Jehu's name, first of all, gives us a clue. Most of the names that we're given here in Scripture, they have a meaning behind them. And Jehu's name means he is Yah. Okay, and he is the son of a man named Jehoshaphat, which means Yahweh judges. So what that means is that Jehu is a name that emphasizes his role as, as God's avenger, God's human instrument. So when you think of Jehu, his name means he is Yah, uh, meaning God is Yahweh his God. But what we're really reading in, in this name and what we're seeing in the actions here is that Jehu is carrying out the actions of God. Jehu, in one sense, is fulfilling the role of God in this story because he's the one who enacts God's judgment. And so the name kind of clues us into that, okay? And his father's name, meaning Yahweh judges, even adds to it, all right? Now, he is also somebody who is a foreshadow, a forerunner of Messiah. And we see that in several ways, not just in his name, but we see it in the fact that he's anointed in secret, right? The, the prophet comes that Elisha sends, carries him into an inner room, shuts the door, and he's anointed in secret, and yet he comes out to challenge the ruling powers of the day. So what you have is this, this king that's unknown. He's not known as a king at first. And uh, that's a reminder to us, isn't it, of the Lord Jesus as we read back uh, through the New Testament, that he came as a king who was not really recognized as a king and yet challenged the powers of his day. But there's something else here that clues us into his role as sort of a foreshadow of Messiah. He's described here as being anointed by a mad prophet in, in chapter 9, verse 11, right? Uh, one of his, his uh, compatriots there who's with him uh, says in verse 9, um, let's see, am I in the right place here? Uh, excuse me, I'm in verse, I'm, in, I'm looking at verse 9, it's verse 11. Uh, now Jehu came out to the servants of his master, and one of them said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know very well the man and his talk. So, in other words, this prophet had a reputation for being uh, kind of crazy, I guess sort of a, a sort of a madman. Then a little bit later in the passage, you have Jehu being described as a madman. And what is one of my absolute favorite verses in all of Scripture uh, Joram, the king of the northern kingdom, they're looking out across the plains, and they see a, uh, or they excuse me, they see Jehu and his men coming. They see all of his this force coming toward them, and uh, the man that sees him in verse twenty says, uh, "This watchman reports he came even to them, and he did not return. And his driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously." So this is the NASB. I don't like this translation. Uh, the word is he drives like a madman. It's the same word that's used of the prophet in verse 11. So what are we being shown here? Why this mention of madness in these two men? Well, a little bit later in the text, we see that he has a zeal for the Lord that causes him to act in ways that would look mad, right? He challenges uh, one of his uh, compatriots in the next chapter, in verse 16, he says, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. And then he came to Samaria, and what did he do there? He killed all who remained loyal to Ahab, or remained to Ahab in Samaria, until he had destroyed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. Um, there were 70 sons uh, of, of Ahab here. He had them beheaded. Um, he pulled all kinds of, uh, of tricks to get everybody that was in Ahab's family and to kill them. And so he's bringing this judgment. So he's a type of, of Messiah in that he's got this zeal for the Lord that causes him to do things that most of us might look at and say, boy, he's, he's a madman. Now think about Jesus in John 2 when he goes into the temple and he begins to overturn the tables of the money changers and he fashions a whip and drives the money changers out of the temple. 
And his disciples are reminded of the text that says, zeal for the house of the Lord will consume me. And Jesus' anger was, was evident because they had turned the house of the Lord, which was supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations, into a den of thieves. And so Jehu's given us a little preview of this sort of uh, uh, seeming madness of, of this messianic figure. Um, because he's doing things that to normal people would look like madness. He's having tons of people killed, and uh, he's got blood all over him. So we see then, as we move forward, uh, this guy, uh, Jehu, taking this vengeance out on the house of Ahab on behalf of God, and uh, it begins with Joram uh, dying uh, in chapter 9. Uh, Joram comes to him, and he says, Is it peace, Jehu? Now, we're going to see that phrase come up again and again. Is it peace? Uh, or is all well, um, and he comes out to him, and Jehu says, how can there be peace so long as the, the harlotries or the whoring of your mother, uh, Jezebel, and her witchcrafts are so many? And uh, Joram knows immediately that the gig is up, and so he turns to flee, but he's shot with an arrow, and he dies. Then you have Ahaziah, who's the king of Judah. He's there, and uh, Jehu kills him as well. Uh, because he had basically uh, befriended uh, the, the descendant of Ahab. And then you get Jezebel. And so Jehu enters the gates, and uh, he comes to Jezreel, which was sort of the, the second most important city in the northern kingdom. It's where uh, Ahab and Jezebel hung out. They had a, a palace there, and they were often there in Jezreel. And so Jezebel hears that he's coming. And I love this. Uh, she goes in, and she paints her eyes and adorns her head and looks out a window. So it seems like she's trying to um, seduce him or make herself attractive for him. That's at least the, the impression we get from the text. And she asked the same question that Joram had asked. Is it well? Now it's translated a little differently, but is it well is the same phrase. Is it well? And she doesn't call him by his name Jehu. She calls him Zimri, which was a king that had a very, very short reign. And she knows by now that Joram is dead, and she's telling Jehu, your reign's going to be really short. You're going to be like Zimri. And so he looked up to the window, and he said, who is on my side? And two or the three officials looked down at him, and he commanded them to throw Jezebel down, throw her out the window. And so they did. They threw her down. We don't know the height, but apparently it was a high enough fall that it killed her. Uh, and it was apparently high enough that her blood splattered on the wall. And uh, so he came in, and he ate and drank. Now that's interesting because some have argued that her death was almost like a sacrifice and the meal that followed sacrifices sort of comes afterwards here. And, um, and the reason they argue that is because her death and the death of the rest of Ahab's line um, it, it assuages God's anger. It soothes God's anger because God is angry at uh, Ahab and his, his lineage and he's, threatened, he's promised to wipe them out and now he's done that. Um, as soon as the rest of these are killed. And so what does Jehu do? He goes in and eats and drinks, just like he would do after making a sacrifice. And so some have argued that that's what's taking place here. Um, but the interesting thing is he goes in to eat and drink, and they just leave Jezebel laying in the street. And then he says, look, go bury her because she was a king's daughter. Let's at least give her that. And when they go out, they can't find her except for her uh, hands uh, and her feet and, uh, and her skull. Uh, her skull. And uh, the dogs had eaten her, which is exactly what Elijah had said, um, that the dogs would eat the flesh of Jezebel. And he said, the corpse of Jezebel will be as dung on the face of the field in the property of Jezreel. So nobody would be able to say, this is Jezebel. Now, this is interesting because, again, we're seeing Jehu here as sort of a, a preview of Christ, right? A forerunner or a foreshadowing of Jesus, a Messiah. Um, and the death of Jezebel here is very much a foreshadowing of the judgment that Christ will bring against the great harlot in Revelation 19. So just like here in 2 Kings 9.37, where we read that Jezebel's corpse is going to be like uh, basically dung on the face of the field, um, you go to Revelation 19, and, and a text we've looked at about a year ago, and you see this, this prostitute, this great whore, who's um, a, 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 a picture of, of the world system, right? Um, whether you want to say it's Rome or whether you want to say it's, it's some other world power at that time, it's, it's a picture of the world system that opposes God. 
And notice what happens. Um, after these things, this is Revelation 19, 1 and 2, I heard something like a loud voice because of the great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Now we're told this repeatedly throughout the text that we've been looking at at the end of Second King or First Kings, beginning of First uh, Second Kings. We're told repeatedly that God is going to avenge the blood of His prophets that Jezebel had killed. She was feeding the prophets of Baal at her own table and killing the prophets of God. And we're told that God is going to avenge that blood of his servants. And we're told the same thing here. And then you skip down to verses 20 and 21 of Revelation 19, and here's what you read. The beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. Now that's Jesus. That's the risen Christ. And what is the sword that comes out of his mouth? It's his word. He destroys them through his powerful word. And it says, all the birds were filled with their flesh. So just as Jezebel's body was eaten by dogs and essentially deposited on the landscape as, as dung, so also these who followed the beast and the false prophet are killed with the sword of the Messiah, and the birds eat their flesh, and they're eventually going to leave them as refuse on the, on the landscape. And so what we see in Jehu here and the death of Jezebel is very much a foreshadowing of the judgment that is to come. Now, let me make some application here over the next few minutes, and we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up and wrap up our study. I'm going to make four points of application pretty quickly. The first one is this. Um, we need to be reminded that it's important what kind of name we leave behind. Our last message in this series focused on leaving a legacy as we looked at the end of um, Elijah's life and the beginning of Elisha's ministry. So I'm not going to dwell on that here, but it's worth remembering um, that all of us are going to leave a name behind. Now, the name Jezebel is synonymous with evil, even down to our very day. Uh, so none of us name our little girls Jezebel, right? Because if we did, we would make that, that poor child a, a laughing scorn in our own culture. And so the question is, what kind of name will we leave behind? Um, Proverbs 22.1 tells us, A good name is to be more desired than great wealth, and favor better than silver and gold. So I'm not going to dwell on that anymore since we did talk about it, but it's worth remembering here because we remember the legacy of Jezebel as one of just absolute evil and wickedness. The second point I want to make is that God's justice, even though it might be long delayed, will always be carried out. Um, in fact, 2 Peter 3, 9, a text we know, uh, I think you know probably well, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, what I'll point out there is not that the Lord is not going to execute judgment, nor does this mean that his anger and his just wrath against sin is somehow pushed to the side, and, and it's just not there. He's still angry about sin, and he still intends to judge sin, but he's exercising grace and patience and compassion. But that is not to cause us to think his judgment isn't coming. Instead, it's to show us the wonders of his grace that lead us to repentance, should lead us to repentance. In fact, one of the things we see in this text, we've seen it with Jehu twice he's asked in what we've just read, is it peace, Jehu? Um, in fact, in the text, I think it's three or four times he's asked this question in a short period of time. And um, essentially he says, no, there's no peace until, until you're all dead. And then he proceeds to carry out judgment. And I think that's a, a helpful reminder to us. And in one sense, there is no peace in this world until the judgment of God is carried out. It doesn't matter what men do. It doesn't matter if 90% of humanity becomes united in some sort of goal or some sort of way of thinking. Our world is rapidly um, seeing a culture develop that is worldwide. And um, so, so what if 90% of the world, 95% of the world um, thinks that way, you know, in a way that, that is wicked, in a way that is opposed to God? Does that mean the world's going to be at peace? 
No, it doesn't. There's not going to be peace until God's judgment is carried out. Um, and so it's a reminder to us that we live in a world very much in turmoil until Christ returns and brings salvation through judgment. In fact, Jehu's judgment here is sort of a type of salvation uh, for the, the godly people of Israel. Think about the prophets who were always in hiding because of Jezebel. This is salvation for them. So God's justice, though long delayed, will always be carried out. Don't fool yourself into thinking that, you know, God's been, uh, he's not done anything about it yet, so he never will. Uh, don't be that foolish. God is, uh, doesn't uh, reckon time the way we do, and he will carry out judgment. And that leads to a third application here, and that is, is that God's justice, though long delayed, is not thereby minimized. Um, we're told in 9, 7, chapter 9, verse 7, that Jehu's work is the vengeance of God being carried out. And um, this is uh, pretty brutal vengeance here. Now, with you and I, I mean, everybody's different and every situation is different, but I'm sure you've been in a situation, I have, where, you know, somebody does something and it kind of angers you or maybe even very much angers you. And um, But as time goes by, you sort of, you, you sort of um, forget about it and you sort of move on and you just don't let it bother you anymore and, and maybe the person repents or maybe, uh, you know, you, you, you see some mitigating circumstance in their life and you just kind of give them, give them grace and, and, um, and you let it go. And what I'm saying is over time, our anger can sometimes cool down. It doesn't always do that, but much of the time, time sort of heals all wounds and our anger will be cooled down. But our anger is not like God's. God's wrath, God's anger, is his righteous, settled opposition to sin. So as long as there is sin in the world, there's going to be the wrath of God to deal with in terms of sin. So when judgment comes, even though it's been long delayed, it's not going to be minimized. Judgment is going to come and it's going to be horrific. The destruction of Jerusalem, in fact, is cast by Jesus in terms of God's vengeance for the death of his prophets. You go read Matthew chapter 23, verses 34 through 36. And uh, notice what he says, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you'll kill and crucify, and some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come on this generation. And Jesus, I think, there is talking about the soon coming destruction of Jerusalem. And he's saying it's going to be God's vengeance for all the prophets' deaths that, that the people of Jerusalem have brought about and for your sins. Um, because you're persecuting, you're persecuting the, the apostles, the prophets, the, the people that I'm going to send you. And so God's justice uh, may be a long time in coming sometimes, but it's not going to be minimized or diminished because of that. And then finally, just one last thing we need to say before we, we finish out here is that judgment as well as mercy and compassion are part of God's character. Um, and, and we need to remember that. In these two chapters, uh, chapter 9 and 10 of 2 Kings, Jehu is shown to be a bloody avenger. There's a lot of blood in this story. i am not read it for you, but you've read it. So there's a lot of blood here, right? Uh, send me the heads. If you're going to Tell me you're uh, loyal to me. Send me the heads of all of Ahab's kids. And then let's pile them up at the door at the gates of the city here overnight. And just let everybody see them. Um, and uh, yet, when you come to Jehu's description in chapter 10, verse 30, notice what's said about Jehu. The Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in executing what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Now, Jehu's reign itself was going to be very short. In fact, by the end of the chapter, he's already gone. Uh, so he did have a short reign, but his sons continued on. He wasn't perfect. The text tells us that. But he did carry out the Lord's will in terms of executing his judgment. And notice the way it's described right here in verse 30. It says, you did according to all that was in my heart. Now, that phrase doesn't give us the impression, does it, that God did this reluctantly or begrudgingly or that somehow, you know, this isn't really what God would prefer to do, but he just just had to do it, you know, it was kind of left to no choice or something to that effect. 
I mean, we sometimes think of God as one who judges only when pushed to the breaking point, right? And then when he does judge, it's always with reluctance or sadness and that sort of thing. And I think we, we often have a view of God like that. And we've probably known people like that, right? Um, people who you could push around and push around and push around, and one day they just snap and they break. And you see that anger come out, right? Um, and, you know, there are some verses of Scripture that lead us to believe and, and teach us, right, that, uh, in other words, God is not pleased with the judgment of the wicked or, or God takes no pleasure in the judgment of the wicked or that sort of thing. But that's not a complete picture of everything that Scripture says because Scripture shows us that God is absolutely vindicated through judgment uh, and his righteousness is affirmed through judgment. And when you read the book of Revelation, you don't ever get the impression that somehow the judgment of God is, is um, somehow a slight against God's character, um, right? God is shown to be the offended party in the book, in the book of Revelation. It isn't that, that the people who are being judged are somehow being unfairly treated or mistreated. God is the one who's been mistreated and unfairly treated because they've rebelled against his righteous rule. And so when he comes with judgment, it's a vindication of his, of his justice and his righteousness. So there is a very real sense in Scripture in which God is glorified through the judgment of the wicked as well as in the salvation of the lost. The judgment of the wicked will not be a black mark on the character of God because justice and righteousness and holiness are just as much part of God's character as his love and his grace and his mercy. Um, let me take it one step further and we'll kind of finish here. Why do we as Christians not take vengeance on those who wrong us? Now think about that before you answer. Pause the video and talk about it maybe if you're watching with your family. Why do we as Christians not take vengeance on those who wrong us? Is it because God is love and we're supposed to imitate him, you know, and, and be merciful to those who mistreat us? That's true. There's truth there. Um, is it because we're to turn the other cheek? Well, there's truth there. But that's not the reason that Paul gives. Those aren't the reasons that Paul gives us for not taking vengeance. The reason Paul gives us for not taking vengeance is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. And here's what he says. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. So you don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So we don't take vengeance because God has promised to do that. And we can entrust ourselves to his judgment. Just like God avenged his prophets that Jezebel had killed, how many years did she carry that out before God took his, took his judgment on her? Or the, the harlot in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, how many centuries did she have power until God came and took justice on her, you know, dispensed justice on her. So God is going to take vengeance on the wicked, and that includes those who mistreat his people. And so we trust vengeance to him. Um, Jesus tells a parable, I'm done with this, of a wealthy landowner who rented out his vineyard to some farmers. And then when the time came, uh, he sends his servants, right? And they're going to collect the proceeds from the crop. And of course, the people who did the work keep a portion of it. And that's how they make their living. And uh, he makes money off the land. And uh, so when he sends his servants, what do these uh, farmers do? They're wicked. And it says they killed uh, some of his servants. They stoned some of them. They beat some of them. And then he sends a second group with the same results. And finally, he sends his own son. And these wicked men said, this is the heir. Let's kill him and then we'll just keep the land. And so Jesus asks, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. And you know what? They were right. They responded correctly. Read the following verses of that passage in Matthew 21, uh, verse 40 and following, and see how this is applied to the Jews in Jesus' day. So in the final analysis, God's judgment and patience is long suffering. His judgment may take a long time to come, but when it comes, it will not be diminished 
and it will certainly arrive uh, in his good time. And in the end of the uh, day, at the end of analysis, nobody wants a God who is unjust. That's a sermon for another day. Um, but even people who pretend that they don't want to see judgment, they want judgment on some. And so, uh, you know, we, we take the description of, of God as it comes to us in Scripture. And when God's described as both uh, holy and loving, we have to take both of those things seriously. All right. Um, listen, God bless, church. Uh, this is our last study here. And uh, what we're going to do is shift over to another Old Testament book next week. And uh, I've got a plan, but I want to surprise you with it a little bit. And uh, we're going to kick off a study that will last us a little while. But, uh, but we'll be starting another Old Testament book I think you'll really enjoy starting next week. And Lord willing, eventually we'll get back to meeting in person. Um, but, uh, but for the time being, we'll continue to put out our videos on Wednesday. So I hope they're helpful to you. Um, God bless, and I look forward to seeing you soon, church. Um, we'll see you Sunday.